to hear a voice, to receive the impartation of the Spirit, to commune with the infinite source of our good. Recently, a college professor wrote a book on the subject of religion and the mind, and he starts his book with a question. And the question is <clears throat> to the effect, is religion outmoded in this age, and is it finished? Has it any place in the modern world anymore? <clears throat> in view of what is known, in view of what science has revealed, what place now has religion? <clears throat> and he answers his question with a yes and a no. No, he says, there is no longer any room for religion as it's known in churches. The day is past for such religion. And yes, <clears throat> there is room for the religion of mysticism based on a metaphysical premise. <clears throat> But because the professor has no actual experience with mysticism, he makes out a very poor case for it and doesn't prove his point very well. Mysticism is any teaching that accepts the possibility of direct communion with God. That is, any teaching that says that it is possible for one to pray to God and receive a direct answer is mysticism, or any teaching admitting the possibility of direct impartations from God to man would be mysticism. The ability to become consciously one with God, to attain a state of consciousness that would be called oneness or at one with God. All of this is under the heading of mysticism, and so those who have studied any form of spiritual metaphysics, I mean by that either unity or, new, or uh, Christian science, would be <clears throat> under the heading of mysticism. Because both in unity and in Christian science, there is prayer, communion, silence, and uh, the turning to the Father for a direct answer to our problems. However, these are starting points on the road to a complete religion of mysticism in which an individual 
would be completely free of doctrine, creed, ritual, formula, or even uh, allegiance or membership in a group or sect set apart from others. Mysticism, in its highest sense, has to do with our relationship to God. But of course that means your relationship or mine, not our relationship. We have no joint relationship with God. We have an individual relationship with God. That means that the mere fact that we are all in one room would not necessarily mean that that we are all consciously one with the Father. It does mean that one in the room, consciously one with the Father, would benefit all the others in the room in proportion to their own receptivity to God. Let us assume for a moment that no one in this room is concerned with a problem of any nature, but has come here for only one purpose, and that is communion with God, to hear the still small voice, to receive the benediction, peace be with you, my peace I give unto you my peace, Christ's peace, God's peace. Assuming that, should any one in this room attain conscious union with God, then everyone in this room would, uh, in a measure, receive that benediction, that release from sin, disease, lack, limitation, fear, but you see, that could only happen in proportion as one's desire was for God-realization, not for the overcoming of a problem. That is why I say that our relationship with God is an individual one. No one can complete the demonstration of union or oneness for another. Because each one, in order to complete that relationship of oneness with God, must forsake the desire for material gain, material good, and lose it for the purpose of the greater gain of spiritual good. You see, the Master said that my kingdom is not of this world. And then he also said, my peace I give unto you. Then my peace is not something to do with this world. That is. It has nothing to do with the material concept of good. And so if one were thinking in terms of benefiting materially by that my peace, they would set up a block. And yet, in receiving my peace, one would automatically find their so-called human situation so straightened out that no problem would exist again. It is a strange thing, almost contradictory, not quite, but that in losing our attempt, giving up our attempt to demonstrate material or human good, we gain complete good in our 
individual and daily, what we call human experience. It is true that one does not have to go far to see the failure of the church to bring peace on earth, prosperity, happiness, morality. Nor does one have to go far to see that those who have approached, even in a measure, the mystical way of life, have gained greater health, greater security in their supply, and above everything, greater peace of mind and peace of soul and harmony of life. You'll find that among the Quakers, and they are the original mystics of this continent, and the Christian scientists, and many Unity students, you will find a far greater degree of freedom from the world's problems than you will anywhere else in this world. And that is because these have, in some degree, touched the hem of the garment. They have touched a closer relationship to God. They have touched a closer approach to a dependence, a reliance, and above all, a conformity to the laws of God. Now, this is only a beginning. As you carry your mystical teachings further, you will find even greater benefit. Let me take uh, for a moment John's statement that God is love. God is love. Then harmony peace, satisfaction, good, can only come into our experience through love, since God is love. Then God power would mean love power, and it would mean that since God is power, love is power. All we have to do now is turn to the great Master of mystics, Jesus Christ, and see what he has to say about love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love thine enemy. Love those that persecute you. Pray for your enemy. Put up thy sword. Those who live with the sword will die with the sword. Forgive. Forgive seventy times seven. Forgive over and over and over and over again. Neither do I condemn thee. the woman taken in adultery, neither do I condemn thee. To the thief on the cross, this night thou wilt be with me in paradise. Who hath sinned, this man or his father? Neither. Neither do I condemn thee, neither do I judge thee. 
Who made me a judge over you? You see, this is love. Now then, only in proportion as we embody love within our consciousness, only in proportion as we learn the secret of not condemning, not judging, not criticizing, not holding anyone in bondage to their errors of commission or omission, forgiving, praying that the eyes even of our enemies be opened to the Christ, praying always that God be the light, wisdom, understanding, governing all men. As we bring love into our experience, knowing no more race, color, creed, knowing no more friend or foe, but inwardly realizing that power of love, we are lifted to a basis that frees not only our own being, but all those who come within range of our thought, we free them from their errors, even as we are freed of ours. And it works in this wise. Follow this carefully, because this is how healing work is done. When uh, one has passed the metaphysical stage of healing, the metaphysical stage of healing, of course, is with the use of argument, knowing the truth, declaring the truth, affirming the truth, denying error. But there is a higher form of healing than that, and it's pure spiritual healing. And in this form of healing, you conform to, I was about to say an ideal, but ideal is not the word to a reality, a truth, which is beyond all argument, and that is this. Since God is uh, the law, the substance, the reality, the cause of all being, everyone is the image and likeness of that being, and all that that being is Every individual is. Now that, that is a truth. We're not declaring that truth in this treatment. I am stating that truth as a premise. That God really is the essence of your being and of mine. And I mean of all being. Friend or foe. Saint or sinner. God is the principle. God is the essence of individual being. Please remember that. God is the essence, the principle of individual being. And we have nothing to do with whether the individual at this moment is appearing to us in some form of sin or some form of disease or even some degree of death. We are concerned now with the truth. God is the essence of all being, individual being. Yours and mine and his and hers and its. God is the principle of it. God is the essence. God is the substance, the law, the activity of all being. Of course, we will admit that judging by appearances, this would not seem to be true. Looking at each other in the mirror, we do not behold any such glorious being. 
And so it becomes necessary to shut our eyes to the appearance and even shut our ears to what we may hear. Now, not looking directly at our patient and uh, not listening uh, to what they have to say about themselves, we turn within and remember we can only do this now if we have been filled with that love uh, that I've just described. Turning within now, we have no hate, fear, condemnation. We have no sense of error about our friend or patient or ourselves because we are recognizing only that part of them which is the Christ, the Son of God, the image and likeness of God, God expressed, God manifest, God revealed. Because we are filled with God's love, and we now entertain no thought of criticism or judgment, and we entertain no thought of fear or doubt, we are enabled to look right through the appearance of ourself, our friend, our patient, and remember why God is the essence of all being. Now, in remembering that, we have nothing further to do with metaphysical treatment. We have only now to do with maintaining this inner peace and, an, and a listening attitude until from within our own being comes an answering assurance, all is well. Or, I am with you. Or, the sense of relief, of peace, that tells us all is well. It is true that in actual practice, even though we have had that feeling of healing, the patient does not always respond at once. And so we may get another call and we may have to do it again and again. In uh, some very acute cases, and more especially when there are evidences of great pain and so forth, I have found it wise to have uh, the one turning to me for help contact me if they're close by every hour. I have had one case where for a whole night through I had them contact me every 20 minutes. And uh, because of one circumstance or another it took the entire night even with a call every 20 minutes before that case, that discord, that erroneous sense, had uh, been released. The main point is this. This isn't a question of whether every case is an instantaneous healing. It isn't a question of uh, a fault of the patient or of the practitioner if there isn't an immediate response. It's just a question of the practitioner's willingness to stand by until the relief comes. Now the reason I make the point of uh, this healing, since healing of course is only one part 
of the religious or mystical life. The reason I make a point of using this as an example is this, that in living the life of a mystic, in living the truly Christ life, the spiritual life, one's entire attitude must be that of love. Love must be the motivating and the guiding impulse of our experience. In other words, we must develop ourselves to the point where we hold no one in judgment or criticism or condemnation, where we entertain no feelings of separation from our fellow man. That doesn't mean that we won't have individual opinions. It doesn't mean that we will not, uh, that we will agree with some uh, teaching which our intelligence won't permit us to accept. Nor does it mean that we necessarily will all vote the same uh, party ticket or for the same candidate. It doesn't mean giving up of our individuality or our sense of right or wrong. It means giving up our sense of judgment and permitting each to go their own way and follow their own conviction, but love them just the same. See that the basic spiritual part of them is God. In other words, regardless of our disagreement on the human level of life, let us within ourselves understand that we, regardless of race, color, crime, or nation, or political affiliation, are one in Christ. Let us also see that whatever we do, or others do, that does not conform to this standard, should not bring forth from us criticism, judgment, or condemnation, but rather forgiveness. In every case, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I sit in judgment on thee. Who made me a judge over anybody? And so, closing our eyes to the physical appearance, we can agree that spiritually, within our own being, we are one with each other, we are one with every individual on the face of the globe, because of our sonship with God, our sonship, our brotherhood in Christ. Now, in that consciousness of love, in which there is neither judgment, criticism, condemnation, nor fear, all sense of opposition to error fades, and in fading, all discord fades with it. Because all discord is nothing more or less than a false sense entertained within our own being. It is not one for which we are necessarily responsible, because everyone that has ever been born is a victim of universal belief until through some activity of their own consciousness they begin to understand that they were never born of woman, that God is the creative principle of their being that what we call mother and father are but instruments through which the principle of life has made itself manifest. But that the creative principle is neither man nor woman, but God. Man and women, men and women are but the instruments of the activity of God. Then you understand that God as the Father, 
and you likewise understand the brotherhood of man. That recognition, too, is love. Now you can see that a religion of this type makes it possible for us to love each other and yet not be in bondage to each other. To love each other and yet set each other free in God's government. To love each other and yet not be responsible for each other, only to be responsible for our concept of each other. We are responsible that we behold God as the very being of each other, that we are responsible for. And in assuming that responsibility, we set our friends and relatives free to be God-governed. In this religion of conscious union with God, conscious oneness with God, do you not see how groups can come together all over the world for the one common purpose of worshiping God, of uniting in conscious union with God, and yet not binding themselves to each other by rules and regulations, just allowing each to be free, each to work out his own salvation with God, extending to each other whatever help or cooperation we may be asked for, and then allowing the others to go about their business. I have said in the writings that a practitioner must never claim anyone as their patient, certainly not beyond the one treatment they have asked for. The moment that treatment has been given, the so-called patient is free, and they have the right never to come back or to seek anyone else they wish. I have said that a teacher must not claim anyone as a student beyond the student's own desire to be the student. In other words, any day, any day, and any moment of any day, any student of ours is free to come or to go with no ties, no bondage. Now do you see how impossible that relationship of freedom would be if we had membership and if we had churches and if we had uh, financial obligations that went beyond this minute? Now it is for that reason that the mystical religion, the religion of conscious union with God, must be an association of those on the spiritual path, yet it must be an association in which there is no tie, no bond except the bond of love, and the bond of love is one of freedom and relief. When we are good to each other, kind to each other, generous to each other, loving to each other, honest with each other, not because of a tie, but because of this innate spiritual integrity, then only are we God-governed. In other words, if you are obeying the Ten Commandments, with any thought in your mind of punishment for their violation, that does not represent spiritual integrity or the mystical approach to life. 
The law came by Moses. Grace, truth, came by Christ Jesus. If you are in conformity with some form of conduct, because there is a law to that effect, or because there is a punishment for its violation, you have not come under the grace of God. You have not come under the grace of Christ. You are under the law. The mystic is good. The mystic is honest. The mystic is generous, loving, kind, forgiving, but not because there is any rule, not because there is any association demanding it, but because they have found their freedom in God and uh, their integrity is of the spirit. And therefore, it is an integrity that is given to all mankind regardless of obligation, regardless of rules or laws or punishment. Let me assure you of this. In the Hebrew way of life, I mean by that the Old Testament way of life, where God rewards the good and punishes the evil, it is a continuous round of living under the law and good today and evil tomorrow, advancing into the household of God in the nature of the Christ, one finds their spiritual freedom and no longer comes under the condemnation of either punishment or reward. There is no punishment for evil and there is no reward for good. There is only the normalcy and naturalness of living and of loving, of being alive and of being loved. And love itself, and life itself, is the only reward. To live in this spiritual idea of life, one seeks no reward, no recognition. One seeks nothing but the opportunity to let God function in the entirety of their being. At first glance, this seems like a difficult program. And it seems as if it might be a difficult way of living. But it isn't. It happens to be the most simple of all. And it is so for this reason. And I'm going back now to one of our previous talks. To illustrate this point, because this not only governs our ability to enter the spiritual life, but actually it has application to every activity of our existence, including that very important one of supply. We have in Scripture the statement that to him that hath shall be given, from him that hath not shall be taken even the little that he hath. And to many this has been a very difficult quotation to understand. In the light of Elijah's experience with a widow and a cruise of oil, and of the master with the five barley loaves and a few fishes, this statement of uh, to him that hath shall be given will become clear. 
Elijah says to the widow, What have you in your house? What have you in the house? The widow doesn't answer nothing. She doesn't answer, I have nothing in my house. Just a little oil in the cruise. A little oil in the cruise. And he lets her begin to pour. And as soon as she begins to pour that little, it soon becomes evident that the crucible oil is never going to dry up. The master asks, what have we to eat? And he's not told that we have nothing, even though there's a multitude of people there, thousands of But he is told that we have five barley loaves and a few fishes. And the master begins to break, saying as the widow began to pour. And of course, he didn't run out of food until everyone had been fed, and even then there were twelve baskets left over. In every experience of ours, this principle is our principle of supply. Let us suppose that a demand is made upon us, any one of us, for help, comfort, or healing tonight. Let us not answer, I haven't enough understanding, or you'd better call my practitioner. Let us accept the responsibility of the call that has come to us and uh, begin with whatever one statement of truth we can remember. There's anybody in all the world, even if they've never heard of metaphysics, that doesn't know some one statement of truth. And uh, begin to pour that one statement of truth. Begin to break. Begin to share. Begin to express. And you will watch how the second one will come. And the third and fourth and fifth, as long as there is a need. And you will complete your treatment and have your result. In the same wise, never acknowledge that you have a lack. Acknowledge the little that you have and begin with it. Whether it is money, whether it is truth, whether it is time, whether it is service, never, never acknowledge lack, but acknowledge even the little that you seem to have and begin to put it into use. Now, the principle is this. Since God is your being, you are infinite. Now, there is no given moment in which you can realize that infinity. Oh yes, you may, if you attain a great depth of meditation, you may sometime realize your complete union with God, and in that moment you will realize that all that the Father hath is yours. But otherwise, in your ordinary, everyday living, you will never be conscious of infinity around you. And so, you will begin with what you have, and then you will find that it is literally true that God is your being, and therefore your being is infinite. And out of that inner 
selfhood can flow all that is necessary to heal or feed the multitude and leave twelve baskets over. Out of the infinite being, which is your being, since God is your being, you can produce anything and everything necessary for your life unto eternity. But begin. Begin with the few drops of oil or the few barley loaves and begin to express those, let those flow, and then out of the depths of your being the flow will continue as long as there is a need. Now here you see mystical living, spiritual living, at its most practical level. Once you acknowledge God as your being, you have infinity to draw upon from within you, and you can make that much more practical than any other form of religion ever discovered. You know, most forms of religion merely promise that when you die, God will take over. But they don't actually believe it because none of them want to die very young or want to postpone that death as long as they can, even though it is promised them that they're going right to God. No, no. Religion usually isn't practical in our present sense of existence. But the mystical is. The mystical form of religion says, I have me, the world knows not. Ask me for water, I can give you living water. Hidden manna, the wine of inspiration. I can make this practical by bringing to light your supply and your health. That is what the mystical form of religion will do. That is what the spiritual form of religion will do. It will set you free from bondage to the laws of this world. It will set you free from bondage to person, place, or thing. It will set you free in your Christhood. Then you may share with your fellow man as liberally as your own heart permits. There's no limitation, there's no limit to how much you can share, how generous you can be, how much of healing work you can do. No limit since the capacity is God flowing through you as an instrument. The responsibility is upon his shoulder. You will remember in Love and Gratitude that it has been brought out that the gratitude is not yours, the love is not yours, but God, for which you make yourself an instrument, that it may use you pass through you. In our infinite way teaching, we do not use God, we do not use truth, we let God use us. We become the instrument through which the infinite nature of God is poured forth into this world. And so you see how, without bondage to each other, without any tie with each other, with just the spirit of love within us, we can be all things to each other. And yet, every day set each other free, recognizing that none of us has a human tie upon another.
It isn't really believable, but an hour has passed by. And uh, I am sure that this hour itself has been a living proof of the point that has been made here tonight. Sixty minutes have followed each other. And yet, with only enough words to fill one minute, the voicing of those words, those ideas, has been a continuous flow into the next minute, and the next minute. Whereas, if I had sat here and thought about 60 minutes to be filled in, I would have had confusion in my own thoughts because I could never have had 60 minutes of a message in me. But letting it be minute by minute, the 60 minutes have been filled. This is the demonstration of the point. If you are called upon for a healing and you know only one statement of truth, voice it, think it and watch it be followed by another. If you have only one dollar, spend it, dime by dime, quarter by quarter, knowing that as it follows each other, so will one dollar follow upon another dollar. It must be so, since God is your only capacity, and God fulfills itself moment by moment. Even God can't live next hour. Just this minute. Only this minute. Even the sun can't shine tomorrow. Only the moment of its shining. Minute by minute by minute. Out of the infinite nature of God flows this universe day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, on into eternity. Thank you.